<laughs> yeah, we're stacking up the videos one after the other today, so no wardrobe change. Mm. Okay. Hey, I want to ask you about, and you've commented in a couple of your classes, uh, the uh, tragedy known as modern incident command system and how, uh, how, how it has turned into this monster where everybody's an incident commander, uh, whether they've been on the job six weeks, six years, or six decades. You get there, you're the incident commander. Um, on the podcast, you and Bob both have a good chuckle talking about an officer you know, running laps versus not being with their crew. Uh, you may not know that there's a, a, a pretty good collection of data out there regarding maydays and risk scenarios. And 70% of maydays are from companies without a company officer. And uh, to me, that's a pretty big number and a pretty good evidence-based reason to keep that company officer with uh, the hands that are doing the work. I mean, initially, especially on a, on a larger incident, but of course, bread and butters as well. Um, I don't know. Go ahead. Tell me what your... What's your thought process? What's your experience level? Have you ever seen a company officer just let their two or three guys go do their work for them without checking in? Or uh, again, it comes down to the to the department and, and how they want to have their people perform out in the street. Okay, uh, in the past, and especially fire departments that uh, embraced company concept. To be a company officer, you had to know that you're responsible for your people and your company's operations. For example, if you're the uh, officer of the first apparatus and it's an engine, and you're the engine officer, you know where your position's supposed to be, and that's generally right behind the nozzle when that attack is started. In the past, and again, we, we've all talked about it in the past, you know, slow your response coming into a fire, okay? The fire is at one, two, three, four, a Street. So here comes the engine. Instead of coming up full speed and putting on the brakes and skidding past the fire building, <laughs> like and I've felt that before, I've been there, uh, you slow down. And that allows that officer to start looking at things. He's the one responsible for what the company does. It's not the firefighter, it's not the pump operator. He's the one. But nevertheless, Everyone on that fire company should know, yeah, we're going into a working fire. Okay, uh, here's what we got. Look at the neighborhood. Are you coming down a residential street or are you going down a commercial boulevard or something like that? This all helps with everybody having their own side up. But it's still the company officer who is responsible for that. Uh, in regards to that first engine operating and no chief officer on the scene, yeah, he's the officer in charge. And what he gives on that radio uh, when they pull up... Engine one is on the scene. We have a two-story frame, heavy fire on the second floor, appears to be extending into the attic, uh, looks to be occupied, we're stretching in. A simple report like that, okay, and people responding in, knowing that neighborhood. Look, if we're talking about an older town, older city setting, old neighborhood, what are your lots? 40 or 50 feet wide by 120 deep, okay? Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Again, when you go out on your other calls, when you go out on your company inspection, you're doing hydrants, you're doing building inspections, you're returning from whatever, you look at the neighborhood that you're in, you have an idea of what the characteristic is? Do you have ravines or is it all flat ground? Is the land sloping? How about your water supply, your hydrants? All this stuff comes into your pre-fire survey, if you want to call it that, or just know you know when you're first too. Exactly. There should be any no, surprises. Yeah, there should exactly. be very few surprises. I should very say. good. That's the best way to say it. Yeah, should be no surprises. You know, if you're conscientious and so forth. So, look, firefighting is not a perfect world. We talk about it here. We talk about it because we got a conscientious view, like so many guys out there do. Okay, but not everybody's like that. You got to remember that. So, who, that's all the more important. Why whoever that company officer is. That there's somebody that you got to know. Is this guy got his head on straight or is it backwards? And uh, that's the thing. In regards to the incident command, I've said it many times. You're absolutely right. We have kids coming out of the academies. They've been through the ICS class. And I think it's gone farther than what it should. 
and I know that's going to you know, raise the hair on some people's necks, but what I'm getting at is they're taught that here's the way ICS works. From the initial arrival of the first fire apparatus or the first fire person on the scene, that's the incident commander. And then as the other units and other people come in, we pass command accordingly and so forth. Okay, so here's a, here's a young person, you know, uh, graduated from academy. He's standing on a street corner in his town and there's a house on fire. And I'm the incident commander. No, you're, you, no, you're not because there's nothing you can do at that point. You're off duty. You don't have a radio. You don't have anything else going on, you know. And you're pretty much a civilian at that point, okay? But can you take a look at the house and maybe walk around or whatever, you know, and see, uh, see what information you can pass on? Hey, look, I saw this over here or whatever. Or there's somebody hanging out the back or whatever the case, but that's different. So it's, it's kind of throwing uh, some confusion. You know, and it's one of them gray areas. And um, I had this discussion with, you know, some local friends and, and people that disagree, I guess, with maybe my, my look at it. Um, and, and one of the popular arguments I've heard uh, from trusted firefighters that are friends of mine is, well, how are you going to know if somebody needs help and they're hanging out the window out the back? Yeah. And my answer is, how does that change my, my operation? I'm showing up on a, with an engine. Yeah. It's my job to put the fire out. And if, if I only have, if I'm riding with a crew of three or four, you know, how many, can I take one person out of my firefight to go grab a ground ladder to get around the house to put it up to try and do a one person rescue out of a window that's not real likely but what i can do is i can expedite that fire attack right i can get yeah. that line in position yeah. yeah once again it comes down to the conditions that you have what's the most important thing you have to do at that point on arrival with three people on an engine what is the engine's basic job in all of firefighting Get the line out. Exactly. Get water in the fire. So if this person isn't hanging out, you know, with the back of their neck with all the hair burned off them or flames coming out overhead, it might be you got to get that line in that fire and stop it from getting that per, uh, to that person and so forth. Uh, oh, God, something I was going to say right there about uh, ICS and that first officer doing a lap around the building. For many years, uh, we were, we were taught in ICS and, and company officers and uh, company concept and all that other stuff that goes along. You don't separate yourself from your crew. And yet, here's these uh, people who say, oh, he's got to do a lap around the building. Well, right off the bat on arrival, you're separating the officer from your crew. And if you have smoke coming out of this, you know, two-story frame, and here you are standing at the side of the engine or the back step waiting for the... Uh, call about what to do and you're not getting a call from your officer because he took off it's like what's our what's our what's our job what do you want us to do where do we go and so forth and unfortunately without good discipline or guys uh paying attention to what's going on or out without any communications from the officer this is our guys freelance so all the stuff that we talked about not doing in some cases the ics systems encourage it you know because guys are confused about what to do. All it takes is uh, somebody on a wrong radio channel oh, yeah. or forgot to turn on the radio right. or twist their ankle as they're making their lap yeah. and the whole ICS plan starts to crumble. Right. Imagine, if you will, uh, a two, let's say a large two and a half story frame. It's a narrow, deep building, okay? So the two and a half, the half story is actually an apartment up there, okay, with high ceilings and so forth. We don't call them three because it's not a full third floor. But right. anyways, so this building is maybe 25 or 30 feet wide by about 120 deep, okay? So the officer arrives, we have a smoke condition, okay? The officer goes and he's starting to do his lap around the building and here stands this firefighter with the pump operator. You see, you know you got an obvious working fire. You got the smoke, you definitely smell wood smoke, you know it's a working fire inside there. It's just the fire hasn't showed itself yet, hasn't bro broken through a window or whatever but you don't hear from your officer because he's going around a very deep building and he knows he's got to go over. What if he got a fence or some object, you know, or like you said, uh, twists his ankle, you know, he falls down or whatever. What do I do? What do I do? Yeah. 
My officer's not there to tell me what to do. You know, and again, this is where things like, we try to say, obvious working fire, first engine, get that line out of the bed. It runs counter, some of this thinking, runs counter to our thing where it's an obvious working fire in this type of a structure, we need to be able to get this line out of the bed and charge within 90 seconds or less, okay? So, the team concept is destroyed there. Communications is not taking place. Confusion can lay on the fire ground, you know, and next thing you know, that toppling effect. Yeah. You know, if the first engine, as the first line goes, so goes the fire. If we're not getting water in the fire in a timely manner, this is how the fire can I, I think traditionally these, these, uh, the idea of getting as much information from the building before you go in, a lot of that was picked up by initial positioning. Yeah. Seeing three sides with okay. your engine pulling past, you know, this is what the cross lay culture has done, one of the consequences, because you got to line your cross lays up with the front door to make a cross lay be most efficient. Mm -hmm. um, so when we moved away from pulling off the back to a cross lay, we've taken, we took away that, see the, see the third side of the house. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and it, it's one of those things, it, it could be remedied. You know, the guy's just got to walk past yeah. that AD corner and take a look. Um, but unless you practice it, unless that's part of your uh, MO, there's, it can be missed. Again, there's, there's so many things at stake here. Or not at stake, that's not the right word. But, you know, there's so many things you take into consideration here, you know. I'll give an example. You know, for many, many years I worked on a single fire company, you know. And, uh, yeah, you're out in the streets all the time. That thing about being aware of your neighborhood, the buildings and so forth. So, uh, on your non-emergent calls, okay, go out there. You know, you, like, for example, uh, commercial structures, okay, especially multi-story, whatever, you know. Are you, are you looking at the hallways? Are you looking at the doors to get in or get out of this place? Uh, one night, you know, at this old, uh, my old fire company, somebody's pounding on the door, you know, like every so often, somebody's always pounding the door and they're pointing down the street or they're screaming about this or that happening, you know. But as I go to the front door, uh, I noticed it was very bright. This is late at night, it's very bright at the intersection. This is what you and call the, a clue. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and the building across the street, second floor fire is blowing out, okay? Blowing out the second floor. Flat roof, you know, two-story commercial. And, uh, yeah, he's pointing, yeah, Zyvis. We pull the engine out, and because we had been in this building several times over the years and so forth, and everyone working at night knew exactly where the entrance was and how the stairways were and the hallway to get to that area, uh, it was simple. You didn't even need to do a 360 in that, you know, because you knew what the exposures were on the side and the rear. You know, it's a building sitting in the intersection, we pulled the engine right down alongside the building, lined the hose bed up, because where I'm from, they operate out the back of the engine. And by the way, operate from a static hose bed, because yeah. you never know how much you're going to have to pull, okay? But everything was lined up, you know, forced the uh, entry into the door, went up the stairs, down the hallway, you know, and the guy did a great job of, you know, killing the fire. And that's the thing, you know, you have everybody on the same page, being conscientious of the buildings, what their layout is and things like that. It was a lucky thing, you know, just everything kind of fell into place. Who used to do the 360 traditionally? Truck boss, you know, in fire departments. And this is the thing about trucks, you know, when we, when we saw less emphasis on ventilation, it kind of took away from the importance of trucks. Trucks, trucks are as important as engines, and that's why they've always been around in the fire service. Truck work supports fire attack work. In some departments, the trucks always, always had a boss on them because the boss there was known as the combat engineer. And it was up to him when he got on the scene. You know, he always had a truck coming in there. With, with, you never knew if an engine was going to be there or what direction they were coming from. Nevertheless, uh, trucks always had a boss on them, known as the combat engineer. It was up to him to figure out where this fire was, where ladder oh. attention was needed, are they going to the roof or whatever. And that was uh, that guy who was pretty much the forerunner to all this 360 stuff that's going on. Okay, so yeah, yeah, a lot of this stuff was in place decades 
before any of this modern day stuff. Bullshit. You, know? you got proof? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But unfortunately, you know, when, when uh, we, st like I say, you know, when we started seeing Quince become the you all do all kind of fire trucks, you saw lessening of the numbers of firefighters who understood truck work, who were trained to be truck men, who were trained how to ventilate a building, or how to read a fire building, okay, where the ladders go, how the wind's blowing, how effective ventilation and so forth. And uh, it's, it's one of those things that seemed to have gotten away from the fire service. As we got away from the importance of knowing how to ventilate a building, that's when PPV came in too. Oh, look, this is our truck crew. Bullshit. Okay. Yeah, it right. takes trained firefighters. And again, you know, if we don't put that emphasis on it, this is how we get ourselves in trouble. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, anyways. One thing affects the other, huh? Yeah, it does. All right, thanks for clearing it up. Clear All as right. much. Yeah, just a little bit more. <laughs>